New technology is being released onto our streets, and no one is checking to make sure that it or our streets are ready. Teslas should be able to recognize white parked trucks, but they are struggling with this task in the sun. Now, I obviously don't know what the right technology is, but for example, Elon Musk has chosen not to install LiDAR sensors on the self-driving Teslas, calling them expensive. Apparently, these sensors allow the car to more accurately see the object around the cars, and companies developing dedicated robocars for ride-hailing purposes, such as Waymo, Amazon's Zoox, I don't even know how to say this word, but Amazon has a car company, Uber, and a company called Cruise, all of these different companies are using these LiDAR sensors in their vehicles. Because they consider LiDAR to be a critical element because it fills in gaps where cameras fall short. Now, again, I don't know shit about cars or cameras or sensors. And I don't know who's right about what the technology standards should be. But the fact that there is a debate to be had about the necessity of those sensors and the debate hasn't been resolved, that's the point. While there are some voluntary standards, there's nothing mandatory. And each company is allowed to pretty much launch whatever they want onto our streets. Safety and design standards should come first and released to the public last, especially with products as dangerous as cars. And that's not happening. I am so damn tired of being lied to. Hello, darling. Welcome to the 251st episode of Congressional Dish. I'm your host, Jennifer Briney. And if this is the first time that you have tuned into my podcast, first of all, thank you. Welcome. And just so you know, I am a taxpayer who wants to know what Congress is doing with my money and in my name. I don't care about either party. I don't do partisanship. I don't do politics. I want to know what the people we have elected are doing with the power that we give them. So I focus on governing. And today I am going to tell you about the highway and road provisions in the infrastructure law that was passed at the end of 2021, because that bill, the infrastructure law, it's not a bill anymore, it's a law, is being branded as the big accomplishment in the 117th Congress, which has been fully controlled by Democrats. And so I think it's very important for us to know exactly what it did. If you support that effort, if you want to know the details of the laws that are governing your lives, please support this show. This is a listener-supported show. You're not going to hear a single advertisement. That's on purpose. And the show's having kind of a tough run right now. (laughs) I don't really understand what's going on because I haven't done anything all that controversial lately, but we're in the middle of a firing wave. And I honestly, I think it is because people are hurting financially right now. There is a part of Patreon that I can go into and see the reasons why people are canceling their their subscriptions. And it's a lot of my financial situation has changed. And so I completely understand that. And I'm sorry to anyone who's going through financial troubles right now. I know it's a tough time and inflation's hitting us all. But if you are able to support the show, this is a really good time to do it because April was pretty much the worst month we've had in many, many years. And it's not connected to anything controversial, really, that I've said anytime soon. Um, I think it's because our community is suffering a little bit. So if you can step in and help, this would be a great time to do it. And thank you to everyone who is supporting the show regularly. I couldn't keep doing this without you. But today we're going to focus on the infrastructure law, like I said, and I want to start this episode by making sure that I ratchet up your fear a little bit for your own safety, because I just don't think that Americans are as afraid of cars as they should be. Because driving is by far, according to cold, hard statistics, the most dangerous way to travel in the United States. So in 2020, for example, 137 people were killed worldwide in airplane crashes. In 2020, 757 Americans died in train crashes, although I do have to note that more than half of those were drivers who got hit by trains at train crossings. And in 2020, 767 Americans died in boating accidents. 
Now compare that to driving, because in 2020, according to the Department of Transportation, 38,824 Americans were killed in vehicle crashes. And I need you to stop and think for a second about the enormity of that number. The worst passenger airplane crash in history happened in 1977, when two fully loaded passenger jets had a head-on collision on a runway, when one of the jets took off before it was supposed to. 583 people were killed in that crash. It's an event that is remembered all over the world and is memorialized in every single one of the airplane disaster shows that my husband loves to watch so much. 583 people in the worst ever airline crash. On our roads, that many Americans are dying more than five times every month. We average 3,235 American deaths on our roads every month, which is pretty much a 9-11 every single month. And it is every month. That number of car crash deaths in a year is pretty average for my lifetime. In fact, when I was a kid in the early 80s, it was worse. But think about it. Would you ever fly or even walk into a skyscraper ever again if four jumbo jets at a time were crashing into skyscrapers every single month, year after year? I know I wouldn't, but you get into a car all the time. And maybe you shouldn't. Because I know that now that I know the statistics, I've actually known these for years. I have been trying every time it's possible to not get in cars if there's another option, just to maximize my odds of winning another day's round of don't die today. I know that I'm safer on a plane or a train or a boat or by using my feet, at least in places that invest in safe walking for citizens. But sadly, there are a lot of places in the United States that only invest in infrastructure for cars. So for example, my stepbrother's old neighborhood was in Toledo, Ohio, and that neighborhood didn't even have sidewalks. We had to cross one major street to get to Chili's and we knew that we wanted to have some beers and so we figured how about we walk? And walking across that main street was one of the scariest things we've ever done. None of the drivers, so many of them hauling ass alone in gigantic trucks, none of them expected us walkers to be there going simply across the street because who walks in a town with no sidewalks? So the driver's assumptions weren't necessarily dumb But should it ever be death defying to walk across the street? You know, no wonder we're so damn fat in the United States. We make it dangerous to walk. I mean, even if you don't die in a car crash or by getting hit by someone who just didn't see you, even if you don't die, you can definitely get injured. And who doesn't know someone who has been at least hurt pretty badly in a car accident? You're thinking of someone right now, aren't you? There's a shitload of driving caused injuries every year in the United States. The 2020 injuries were actually down significantly because of the pandemic. And yet we still had over 2.2 million car crashes that resulted in injuries in 2020, which is one of the lowest totals of my lifetime. And that's my thing about cars. I know some people love them. And honestly, I truly mean this. That's great. Cars are cool inventions and the designs are cool and the way they've morphed through the years. I understand loving cars and I'm happy that if you're someone who loves them, I'm happy that you have something that brings you joy. And I'm not trying to take anything away from you. That's not what I'm advocating for, except I guess I am saying that I want to take away the traffic because I want the safer transportation options to exist so that I and anyone else who wants to travel in a safer way can have those safer options, and that will only free up space for you on the roads. Everyone wins when we make investments that allow people to travel without getting in cars. And so what I want is investments in basic infrastructure that facilitates safe modes of travel. I want sidewalks. I want bike lanes. I want public transportation. But the infrastructure law spends 80% of our enormous investment on roads, specifically vehicle infrastructure. Instead of transforming a few vehicle lanes into rail or bike lanes, this law is almost certainly going to expand vehicle infrastructure and result in even more driving nationwide. And that's not my opinion, or at least it's not just my opinion. I subscribe to a wonky ass newsletter for government officials called Governing because, of course, I do. (laughs) And it's their summary of the infrastructure law that came to that conclusion. And the reason why it's almost certain that expansions of vehicle infrastructure will result is because there was actually a battle while writing the law about it. 
The version of the bill that passed the House of Representatives would have required that damaged and decaying road infrastructure be repaired before money could be spent on expansions. But that was taken out by the Senate when this bill became bipartisan, as in the fossil fuel representing corporate moles in both parties were allowed by Democrats to ruin it. So big picture, when someone talks about the infrastructure law that the Democrats passed as if it's a good thing, and I make that face, my wide-eyed, nuh-uh, that ain't a good thing face, this is one of my main reasons why. Congress chose to expand the most dangerous method of transportation, one that so many of us are stuck with, instead of expanding safer alternatives for everyone. It's a tragic missed opportunity, and lives will be lost because of it. And so... If we are, which we are, going to expand the most dangerous mode of transportation, it needs to be as safe as possible on the infrastructure level, on the car level. And there needs to be safety for those of us outside of the cars who don't want to end up as gnats on your windshield. And one of the most obvious ways to reduce traffic deaths is to reduce traffic. And so I was pretty happy to see a traffic reduction section in the new law. Now, to me, traffic reduction means getting cars off the road by providing alternative ways to get around. But that's not the approach the infrastructure law takes. Instead, they went with market solutions, because of course they did, as if all decisions made by everyone are made based on money alone. The infrastructure law is simply going to make it more expensive to drive as a way to discourage driving in high traffic locations, especially driving into cities where driving related deaths have been steadily increasing. Specifically, the infrastructure law creates a grant program, which is a grant program gives federal tax money to the states like a gift. So there's no paybacks. And this grant program will be funded at a minimum of $10 million per grant for projects that manage traffic congestion by imposing fees for entering cities, creating and operating new toll lanes, collecting parking fees, and for investing in technology that allows fee levels over the course of the day to be changed based on traffic patterns. The grants can be used to operate commuter buses and vans with at least a guaranteed discount when it comes to these new fees for those buses and vans. And the money can be used to, quote, encourage, unquote, people to carpool. Out of all of those, commuter buses and vans would provide an alternative for drivers. But creating those systems are optional for states. And so that's not a guaranteed thing in every state. The other things funded with these traffic reduction grants are just financial penalties, which would be fine and fair if alternatives existed for everyone. But they don't, which will make a lot of these new financial burdens just straight up unfair for people with no reasonable alternative for driving into the cities, especially if in the city is where they work. And so there will be traffic and for city folk prepare for it to be more expensive. But one of the most frustrating things about sitting in that traffic is the inability to do anything else while you're a driver in that traffic or when you're just a driver in general. Driving requires your full attention. You can't watch TV or read or text friends, even though you have a handheld computer in your pocket, your phone that's always there tempting you with entertainment, which, by the way, we can safely lean into if we're traveling passively by being driven by someone else on, say, a bus or a train. But we all have these addictive little entertainment gremlins in our pockets. And for drivers, those gremlins are deadly. According to the Department of Transportation, just sending or reading one text takes your eyes off the road for five full seconds. At 55 miles per hour, that's like driving the length of an entire football field with your eyes closed. And out of all the distractions that routinely cause fatal accidents, because One out of our 12 9-11s last year was caused by distracted driving. There were 3,142 deaths caused by distracted driving. And distracted driving includes talking on the phone, eating or drinking, futzing with the radio or GPS, your kids being nutty in the backseat. Like there's a lot of ways to be distracted while driving. But it's texting and driving in particular that the transportation department calls, quote, the most alarming, unquote. And so what did Congress do about this universal nationwide problem? Well, they created financial incentives for states, states that create laws that make it illegal for drivers to hold cell phones while driving, has fines for breaking that law and has no exemptions for texting when stopped in traffic. The states are allowed to get the money if their laws have exemptions, though, for using a cell phone for navigation in a hands free manner. So like if you set your Google Maps before you drive and use it, you know, people have those little holders that go into the the air conditioning vents, 
if you do that, that's not going to count as using a cell phone while driving because they do have the technology to check the data on our phones after an accident. And they can tell when the phone was used by a driver and what the cell phone was used for. And so basically, knowing that texting and driving is dangerous for everyone and killed a 9-11's worth of us or so, even during a pandemic year, Congress simply gave some money to the states and said, you deal with it if you want to, which is the weakest of shit. Congress fully chickened out of making the law. They know what they want the law to be, and they know what they want it to be nationwide. And instead of making a damn law, instead of saying texting and driving is illegal nationwide, they kick the responsibility to the states. That's pathetic. Financial incentives that say pretty much pretty please to the states, that's not enough. Congress needs to start making the damn laws, especially ones that are as obvious as this is. In the states that choose to do this, it will save lives. But in the states that don't, well, I just hope I don't have to drive through those states anytime ever. It's such a ridiculous law to have disappear and reappear over state lines when nothing about the cars or drivers on the highways change over those arbitrary dividing lines. Now, one solution to the problem of distracted drivers that has been kicked around is to remove the drivers from the situation, to remove the drivers from the cars and switch us over to a not a utopia, where our infrastructure is still devoted to vehicles, but the vehicles will be robots. Yes, I'm talking about self-driving cars. And companies that currently pay drivers and don't want to, Uber comes to mind, they're spending money to invent this technology so that they can eliminate all those jobs and pocket all those paychecks. And so the first few generations of so-called self-driving cars are already on our roads. I've seen them myself, a few of them actually, this year in San Francisco. Before the infrastructure law, there were no legal standards or laws governing the use of cars with this technology on our roads. And that's despite the fact that cars with automated technology currently have a higher rate of accidents than fully human driven cars, although the injuries they cause generally are less severe. But on average, there are 9.1 car accidents per million miles driven in cars with any kind of self-driving technology, while the same rate is 4.1 crashes per million miles for regular cars. So cars with automated technology are crashing at more than twice the rate of cars without it. So do not tell me these things are safer because they are not. But even calling this technology like self-driving at this point, that's just not accurate. And that is a part of the problem. Because almost all of the technology that's on the road now, at least in the Tesla brand, is labeled and marketed as either autopilot or self-driving. But both of these kinds of automation still require humans to be behind the driving wheel and to pay attention the whole time. And most of the crashes right now are due to humans that are not overriding their robot in time. One such person was Walter Wang, who was killed in March 2018 on the 101 freeway in the Bay Area of California when his Tesla turned left for no reason and smashed him into the barrier on the side of the highway at 71 miles per hour. His Tesla had done the same thing in the same spot four days earlier, but Walter survived that time because he had his hands on the steering wheel. On the day he died, though, he was intermittently playing a video game on his phone while his Tesla did most of the driving on autopilot. Now, that accident happened while the car was in autopilot. But in the last couple of years, the technology in Teslas has advanced to the next stage, which Tesla labels as self-driving. And people have died due to this technology, too. About a year ago, a self-driving Tesla hit a tree in a town outside of Houston and burst into flames. Now, unlike most vehicle fires, which can be put out in minutes, they couldn't put the fire out on the Tesla for four hours because apparently their batteries burn furiously, which I do think we need to know. But the two guys inside of the Tesla died. When firefighters were able to finally reach their bodies, they found that one was in the passenger seat and one was in the back seat. So neither of these morons was in the driver's seat. Now, Tesla, as you might expect, blamed the accident on the not a drivers. But when you sell a self-driving car, people are going to let it drive itself. And it doesn't matter to the dead people what warnings are put in the manual. It matters what people can and actually do with the technology. And other companies like General Motors, they factored reality into their designs. In General Motor cars, the autopilot won't work except for on specific highways that it was designed for, 
and the car has technology that tracks the driver's heads to make sure that they are, you know, first of all, in their seats, but second, that they're paying attention to the road. If they're not, the autopilot won't work. And so safeguards are absolutely possible, and leaving them out is a choice. And with a car as fancy as a Tesla, if a person is supposed to be in the driver's seat at all times, why is the thing even able to operate without the driver's seat detecting a human ass? Basic safety safeguards that even my dumb ass can think of have not been implemented in these cars, and that is partially because the government is not requiring them to. So it doesn't matter that the NADA drivers did something dumb. They shouldn't be able to do something that dumb and have the robot car move. But even if you agree with Tesla, even if you think that being dumb is no excuse and it was their responsibility to read the manual and drive the self-driving car, even if you think that Tesla has no responsibility to its customers that their cars be dumb proof, and even if you have no empathy for those dead drivers, there's no way to pin responsibility on the dead people who are hit by robot cars. In 2019, a Ford Explorer was changing lanes on a Southern California freeway when a Tesla on autopilot slammed into it at 60 miles per hour. A teenage passenger in the Explorer was not wearing a seatbelt and was killed when he was launched from the Explorer. Now that kid, yes, should have had his seatbelt on. But the fact that the driver in the Tesla was on autopilot and not paying as much attention as a real driver would... That's not on the family in the Ford Explorer. We are all at risk when speeding hunks of metal are unleashed without minimum mandatory standards in place. Joshua Brown was certainly at risk behind the wheel of his self-driving Tesla because the technology, it's not perfect. Joshua Brown loved his Tesla and made a bunch of popular YouTube videos showing off all the cool things the Tesla could do on autopilot. Elon Musk himself even retweeted one of Joshua's videos a video showing his Tesla automatically avoiding a collision with a white truck. A friend of Joshua's told the New York Times, quote, he had said, for something to catch Elon Musk's eye, I can die and go to heaven now. He was absolutely thrilled. And then a couple of weeks later, he died, unquote. Joshua Brown died when his Tesla on autopilot failed to recognize a tractor trailer that wasn't moving in front of him when he was driving home from Disney World. The trailer was painted white and the Tesla cameras didn't recognize it in combination with the sun. Three years after that accident, an almost identical crash, a Tesla on autopilot hit a white stationary truck and killed that Tesla owner too. His name was Jeremy Banner. New technology is being released onto our streets and no one is checking to make sure that it or our streets are ready. Teslas should be able to recognize white parked trucks but they are struggling with this task in the sun. And then one thing became very clear to me after seeing article after article about death by Tesla robot cars. Elon Musk needs to be subject to some f***ing rules. While he plays one-man government and dabbles in becoming the new NASA and buying massive social media networks, he's also mass testing Tesla's vehicle technology on our streets and people have already died because of it. And by the way, what is the matter with us where we are allowing one man to do so many important jobs in our society? Because any one of those projects, being NASA, moderating a major social media network, turning cars into transformers, these are all huge undertakings for one person. But this dude is doing all three and we're pretending like it's possible for all three to be done well. If we are going to allow this one unelected weirdo to make such huge decisions for our society, I would like it if he would at least focus his attention on one of those projects, especially when one of those has already killed people. But clearly, he just bought Twitter. Clearly, pioneering self-driving cars is not the only inappropriately huge project on his plate. This guy needs rules. I don't want him to be free in the market to use us as his crash test dummies. And yet that is exactly what he's doing. Other companies that are currently experimenting with self-driving car technology are doing so on private lots. Elon Musk and Tesla are doing it in our neighborhoods. And on top of that, other companies and experts disagree with the safety level of the technology Elon Musk is using on Teslas. Now, I obviously don't know what the right technology is. But for example, Elon Musk has chosen not to install LiDAR sensors on the self-driving Teslas, calling them expensive. 
Apparently, these sensors allow the car to more accurately see the object around the cars, and companies developing dedicated robo-cars for ride-hailing purposes, such as Waymo, Amazon's Zoox, I don't even know how to say this word, but Amazon has a car company, Uber, and a company called Cruise. All of these different companies are using these LiDAR sensors in their vehicles because they consider LiDAR to be a critical element because it fills in gaps where cameras fall short. Now, again, I don't know shit about cars or cameras or sensors, and I don't know who's right about what the technology standards should be. But the fact that there is a debate to be had about the necessity of those sensors and the debate hasn't been resolved, that's the point. While there are some voluntary standards, there's nothing mandatory, and each company is allowed to pretty much launch whatever they want onto our streets. Safety and design standards should come first and released to the public last, especially with products as dangerous as cars. And that's not happening. When the Teslas that were sold with the first edition autopilot feature, when those were upgraded to self-driving, that new capability was simply released as a software update. Drivers didn't have to get any training. It was just all of a sudden their cars could just do more robot things. And our streets have been used as Elon Musk's product testing arena ever since. And nothing in the law stopped that technological advance from going out that way. There were no preparations required. There were no authorizations. It was perfectly legal to use us all as part of his experiment. And shouldn't Elon Musk or anyone else have to ask for permission before putting dangerous products, which robot cars are, onto our streets and into our neighborhoods? Because it's not just Elon Musk. His company is just the most reckless so far. But the Phoenix Times is reporting that a company called Waymo, which is owned by the Google people and is it's kind of like robot Uber. Well, Waymo already has fully driverless cars picking people up in Arizona. And the Phoenix Times reported last month that they'll be on the streets of downtown Phoenix, quote, soon, unquote. Another company, Cruise, which is GM's company, they're about to release their driverless cars onto the streets of San Francisco. They are also about to start manufacturing versions that have no steering wheels or pedals. And yet we know that crashes are happening with current self-driving technology because humans are not intervening in time. And so without a steering wheel, how can we intervene? Do we trust that the next version of this technology is ready to be released on our streets? You know, are we okay with our streets being the testing grounds for these things? Now, for me, obviously, the answer is no. But even if your answer is yes, even if you're fine with testing these in real time around your children in your neighborhoods, shouldn't the companies at least have minimum technological standards established and agreed upon before they do? Because before the infrastructure law, like I said, it was very unclear what kind of regulatory approval, if any, would be necessary before unleashing these robots onto our streets. It's a city by city thing, state by state. There are no national standards for the technology, despite known disagreements by experts. And so what did Congress do about it? Well, by early 2023, the Transportation Department has to conduct a study on the existing and future effects of self-driving cars on infrastructure, mobility, the environment, and safety. So after the infrastructure law, there are still no legal standards or laws governing the release of robot car technology. And so the next time Elon Musk wants to release a software update to hundreds of thousands of drivers all at once and test their robot functions on our roads, this Congress, despite having had hearings and having had access to the same information that I've put in the show notes for you, this Congress ordered a study. That's it. What's to study? We know there are no agreed upon standards. Require standards. We know that Elon needs no one's permission before releasing more autonomous features into cars already on the roads. Require permission. Because this tech can't be perfect or even close. We know it's not. Did you see the video that went kind of viral of the driverless car in San Francisco that got pulled over and then just drove away from the cops? No, it was a hilarious video. I'll give you that. But if you take a step back and you think about it, that's just can't be what's supposed to happen when a driverless car gets pulled over. But what is supposed to happen? How does that work? No one has decided these rules for our roads. And yet that is Congress's job, is to write the damn rules, write the damn laws. And if these cowards aren't going to do it, we need to replace them with people who will. 
This was such a wasted opportunity. And knowing that these robot cars, which I have already seen on the streets of San Francisco, they're being put on our streets without standards or examination by government. This knowledge makes me feel even more unsafe on our roads than I was before. And I'm already pretty afraid of cars. But like a mix of humans and experimental robots sharing the roads, what could possibly go wrong? I guess we'll know because of the study. But they'll be studying our deaths on the roads. Now, one of the reasons constantly stated by the people who love the idea of self-driving cars is that they say it will reduce drunk driving. And that is an important goal. One that could be accomplished, say, with frequent, safe, clean public transportation, but I digress. But in 2020, the number of driving deaths related to drunk driving was 11,654, which is about a third of the driving deaths. It equals 32 of us killed every single day by drunk drivers, which is just another reason why we should have invested in driving alternatives. Because if you live in a place where the only way to get to the bar is by car, you're going to drive the car home, too. Now, if you have a well-lit pedestrian path or a bus that comes by once every half hour, even once every hour. But if you have those other options, you can drink your face off and get home safely. And perhaps speaking from experience, the late night drunk bus can be pretty fun. You might find yourself in a sing along with other drunks. It's not the worst. It's definitely more fun than, you know, closing one eye and trying to drive yourself home without getting caught, killing someone or dying yourself. But for some people that like to go out and drink, personal responsibility only goes so far. You can't choose to walk on a safe path or take a bus or hail a lift that doesn't exist in your neighborhood. But instead of making sure those alternatives exist for all of us everywhere in every state, Congress decided to make sure that the drunk gets stranded at the bar and can't drive, which I guess is better than nothing. But basically, what the infrastructure law requires is that by November 2024, the Secretary of Transportation will have to finish a national regulation that requires passenger motor vehicles be standard equipped with, quote, advanced and impaired driving protection technology. The technology has to be able to monitor the performance of a driver and or their blood alcohol level and be able to prevent the driver from driving if impairment is detected or if the blood alcohol is above the legal limit. Now, apparently, the technology that makes this possible is going to be in the dashboard and can do two things. One, it can monitor our breath via sensors. And two, it can measure our blood alcohol levels through our skin, which sounds like a data privacy issue just waiting to happen, doesn't it? And this law didn't put any rules in place for what the car companies can do with that information or if that information can even be transferred to the car companies. Like, does that information just stay in the car does it get reported to the car company? Can the car companies then sell it to advertisers? Like, can my car tell Honda that this bitch smells like Tito's and then I get Tito's ads on my Instagram the next day? Like, is that the future we have to look forward to? And most importantly, can this information be transferred to law enforcement, either after the fact or in real time? Like, are our cars about to be able to narc us out to the cops? There's a lot of issues here. And none of them were addressed. And this will apply to all new cars sold after November 2030 at the latest. But what about the two-thirds of crashes that happen that don't involve booze? Can the cars themselves do anything to prevent crashes? Why, yes. And they can do so with crash avoidance technology. And on this, Congress actually made a law. The Secretary of Transportation has to issue a national regulation creating minimum standards for crash avoidance technology that must be included, not optional, in all vehicles sold in the United States. The technology must alert the driver of an imminent crash and apply the brakes automatically if the driver doesn't do so, which is great. But it must also include a land departure system that warns the driver that they're not in their lane and corrects the course of travel if the driver doesn't do so. And this is the one I'm not cool with. And I feel like a debate should have been had before Congress made this kind of technology a mandatory requirement because I have this technology in my car and I hate it. And I'm glad I had the, the option to turn it off because it freaks me out. Like if I go outside my lane, my steering wheel shakes and it tries to jerk me back, which if I'm going out of my lane on purpose, which sometimes I do. You know, sometimes there's a car that's kind of in my lane and I just want to 
you know, go around it a little bit. I, as a human, can check and make sure that it's safe to do. And so I go out of my lane. I don't want my car telling me that I am making a mistake. I am in charge here. And yet that's the technology that everyone's going to have. And for me, I felt like it was setting me up for an accident by doing things I wasn't expecting. But now it's going to be mandatory in all cars. I just feel like the American people should have had a say in this. But here's the thing about it. The start date wasn't set by this Congress. This requirement will start on a date that's chosen by the Secretary of Transportation. So Mayor Pete Buttigieg. And car companies don't like having to install technologies against their will. And Mayor Pete is corporate as fuck. So with no timeline being set by law for this, and the other party being Republicans who would rather burn the government to the ground than use the government to demand anything of big business. Well, with no start date required by law, I do question if this will ever really go into effect. Maybe it will, but there's a way for it to maybe not. And in the meantime, crash avoidance technology, even in new cars, remains optional. And so basically, in case my, uh, my message isn't clear, cars are dangerous. And in the case of fossil fuel powered cars, that's true, even if the damn things aren't moving. Now, I have a car with a keyless ignition, and I can testify that it's really easy to forget to press the button and get out of the car with the car still running. But my car is a hybrid electric, and so it's always on electric when it's not moving, and so that's not really all that dangerous for me. But for people with fully fossil-fueled-powered cars, leaving the car on accidentally can fill a garage or house with carbon monoxide and kill the people in the home. That's what happened to Dr. Sherry Hood Penny, who's a woman who shattered glass ceilings and became the president of the UMass system, and Dr. James Livingston, an MIT professor and global expert on magnets. These people were not dummies. And the lives of these incredibly accomplished people were cut short when they accidentally left their fossil fuel powered car running in the attached garage in their Florida condo. The car kept spewing fossil fueled poisons into their home until it ran out of gas and its battery died. Same thing happened to Russell Fish, who left his fossil fuel burning Toyota 4Runner on in his garage. The car spewed poison for nine hours, killing him upstairs. But it also heated up the garage to the point that paint and insecticide cans in the garage exploded and the grill of his truck melted off. The neighbors are lucky that his house didn't catch on fire. And Congress included a provision which will hopefully prevent more of these types of fossil fuel powered tragedies from happening in the future. No, not by making it mandatory for all cars to be electric by a certain date, because electric cars do not spew any toxins because they don't burn fossil fuels to move. Instead, Congress required that by November 2023, the Transportation Department will have to issue a regulation requiring fossil fueled power vehicles with keyless ignitions to have an automatic shutoff system to prevent carbon monoxide poisonings. The amount of time that must trigger the shutoff will be determined by the regulators. And if the regulation is issued on time, this would go into effect most likely on September 1st, 2024. This is one of the few provisions that I think is just good. No problems with it. It's just good. But let's just take a second and consider that if fossil fuel being burned in your garage is poison enough to kill you, what do you think is happening with over a billion tailpipes spewing those same poisons into our enclosed atmosphere pretty much all the time? So, you know, even if you think that climate change is a hoax being sold by blood guzzling, child diddling lizard people sent here straight from hell to enact a green agenda designed to, I don't know. (laughs) I've never understood what the climate hoaxers think the conspiracy theory is. But even if you think it's all a big hoax, can't we all agree that the fact that fossil fuel burning cars are poisoning us all means we should invest in cleaner alternatives? I truly remain baffled that anyone wants fossil fuel power vehicles to still exist. There's just so many downsides. But anyway, let's get back to how cars are dangerous just by being cars, shall we? Because another way that cars can kill when not even moving is when parents forget that their children are sleeping in the back of them, which is more common than I ever thought it could be. But it turns out that about 40 American kids die every year after being left in hot cars. Since 1998, we've lost more than 900 children who were left in cars. And I'm going to spare you the details of the story because they're, these are just too much. And I, I honestly wish I didn't read them. But the reason I did read them is because I didn't understand how this could happen that often. 
But each story, as tragic as they were, each of them made sense. You know, there was the dad who was supposed to drive his kid to daycare for the first time because his wife usually did it. But he just autopiloted to work, not like in a Tesla, but he just was in his routine and forgot that the sleeping kid was in the back of the truck. Happened to another dad who dropped his four-year-old off at daycare, but forgot to drop off the one-year-old twins. He also just went to work and forgot they were in the car. And over and over again, the stories were like these, that the parents were in autopilot mode. Again, not the Tesla kind, but the kind where you just do the thing you do every day. We've all been there. They clicked into their usual routine and forgot the kids were there in a situation when they usually weren't. And because this dynamic is so common, the solution, or at least the one worth trying, is to have something installed in all the cars that will alert the drivers to shake them out of that autopilot mode and remind them to check their car. And so what the infrastructure law did was require that by November 2023, the Secretary of Transportation has to finish a regulation requiring all new passenger vehicles to have some kind of system alerting the driver visually and audibly to check the back seat when the car is turned off. The law says that it's going to be activated, quote, when the vehicle motor is deactivated by the operator, unquote. So it's activated when the car turns off. But my question is, would it always go off when the car is turned off? Because if so, doesn't that just make this just another beep signifying that the car is off? Like, if you hear a sound every time your car turns off, it's not a reminder, it's just a noise. And so I feel like it should have been required to be triggered by weight or something being on the seat, kind of like the seatbelt light does in my passenger seat. My dog is eight pounds, but when she's in the passenger seat, my car knows she's in there and sometimes tells me that she should have her seatbelt on. <laughs> but that tells me that that technology exists. There is technology there that can tell you there's something in this seat back here. Come check it. And so this one's going to come down to implementation by the car companies. And the good news is that they have the same goal. No one wants kids dying in hot cars. And so let's hope that the car companies think this through a bit more thoroughly than this Congress did. Speaking of thinking things through, sometimes the car companies make a mistake and install something on their cars that didn't work and needs to be fixed. And when this happens, it's called a recall. And sometimes the thing that needs to be recalled is a matter of life and death if ignored. And so this is all about notification. And living as I'm living, traveling full time and living a digital nomad lifestyle that I truly believe will come more and more common because it's awesome. I do wonder if I might miss notifications like recall notifications because I only get my mail once a month or so, if that. And it's easy to miss emails in my hellscape of an inbox. And so this provision in the infrastructure law makes a lot of sense to me. It's one that creates a grant program by November 2023 that will give money to states that want to create a process for notifying vehicle owners about any open recalls on their cars when they register their cars with the DMV. And I think that's a great idea because anyone who drives, we have to register our car every year. And so this is a point of contact with the government that's guaranteed. And my only problem with this provision, and it's not a small one, is that the state receiving the federal money is only required to provide these notifications for two years and participation in general is voluntary. And so here's some more weak sh from the 117th Congress. Like, why isn't this just a law? Make the states do it and not just for two years, make them do it every year because this is a matter of national public safety. You know, these recalls aren't sent out to just certain states. They're sent out to everyone who bought the car all over the country. And this doesn't even have to be funded with taxes. We could make the private companies pay for the notifications. We could consider it a fine for fucking up so hard that every one of their customers has to take time out of their lives to fix their mistake. But these people in this Congress, they're so corporate and they're so afraid to make the Private companies pay for anything, even their own mistakes. It's just like the timidness of these members of Congress. It makes me crazy. Another thing that makes me crazy is this inexplicable provision that is the exact opposite of a safety provision. In a provision titled Highway Safety Programs, the infrastructure law prohibits, prohibits the federal government 
from withholding highway safety money to the states if those states refuse to require helmets for motorcycle drivers or passengers who are over the age of 18. And like, what? First of all, I didn't know that there were places in this country where motorcycle helmets are not required for everyone because that seems extremely stupid. Because for every 100 motorcyclists killed while not wearing a helmet, it is estimated that by the transportation department that 37 of them would have been saved if they had a helmet on. Now, considering about 5,000 Americans on motorcycles die every year, saving 37 out of 100 would mean about 1,850 American lives saved per year by requiring helmets, assuming that these people follow the law. And if you are thinking, well, you know, personal responsibility, they chose not to wear one and they died and that's their choice and it only affected them. Um, nope, because there are societal costs to all of these preventable deaths. Now, of course, the guilt and anguish experienced by the people involved in the crash, even if they aren't at fault, is a cost, as is the pain and suffering of the people who loved those motorcyclists, who loved the wind in their hair more than they loved keeping their brains in their skulls. But there's also a financial cost. The Insurance Information Institute estimated that if all motorcycle riders wore helmets in 2017, an additional $1.5 billion in economic costs and $8.9 billion in comprehensive costs could have been saved. That's billions of dollars in medical costs, lost productivity, legal costs, traffic delays, and property damage. And those are real financial costs. And most of them end up being paid by the government, which means that most of them end up being paid by us. And so the decision to ride a bike that can go as fast as a car without a helmet is a bad decision that ripples out much further than that one person. And that kind of selfish decision shouldn't be allowed. And I thought it would be extremely stupid for any states to allow it. It never even occurred to me to check until I saw this provision. But it turns out that most of the states in this country are, in fact, extremely stupid. According, again, to the Insurance Information Institute, only 18 states require all motorcycle riders to wear helmets. 29 states only require people under the age of either 17, 20, or 25 to wear them. And Illinois, Iowa, and New Hampshire have no requirements for motorcycle helmets at all. And yet, Congress didn't require states to require helmets in return for our money. They did the exact opposite and prohibited the Transportation Department from making that demand in return for our money. And they certainly didn't create federal motorcycle helmet laws, even though they should since a motorcycle crash can happen outside of a driver's home state since all our highways are connected, which does make this a federal issue. And this one absolutely dumbfounds me. And it's a provision guaranteed to kill about 1,850 Americans a year to be exact. Moving on, there was one easy vehicle safety precaution, though, that will finally be required to be made available. And this could save the lives of celebrities, prom attendees and bachelor and bachelorette booze hounds around the country. Because by November 2023, a federal regulation will be created requiring that limousines have seat belts in every seating position, including the side facing seats. And I think that's pretty good because I always look for seat belts in limousines and I almost never find them. And I just, I've never understood that. <laughs> I've never understood that because if that driver slams on the brakes, like you can really fly back there. So um, I'm excited that I will at least have the option to protect myself if I choose to in a limo. Not that I'm in a limo all that often. Cause like, who am I? <laughs> but anyway, while we're on the topic of commercial vehicles out of the 38,824 Americans who died in car accidents in 2020, Almost 5,000 of them died in crashes with large trucks. And the vast majority of those deaths, over 4,000 of them, 80% of them, were passengers in the other car, not the truck. And Congress did take a baby step, like a itty bitty 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 baby step towards making those trucks a little safer in the future. So a federal regulation will have to be created by November 2023, which will require new, new commercial vehicles to be equipped with automatic braking systems, and there will be performance standards for those braking systems. But again, this only applies to new trucks. And so all of those big rigs on the roads now will not have to have this technology required or added. 
And so the danger still very much remains until all of their life cycles have expired. And that's a long time from now. Because semi-trucks, the big rigs, they last longer than the cars and trucks that most of us drive. They can go about 750,000 miles before they have to be replaced. And some of these semi-trucks have even hit a million miles. Now, the average semi-truck travels about 45,000 miles per year on our roads. And so that's about a 15-year life cycle, which means that this new regulation really won't be in full effect and automatic braking on all of these giant killers until about 2038 at the earliest. As we have examined today, there are so many ways to die while inside of a car. But the deaths that make me the most angry are the so many people who are killed by vehicles, even though they chose not to get in a car. In 2020, 7,709 Americans were killed walking, biking, and scootering and were hit by cars, which means that about 20% of the deaths caused by driving are suffered by people who choose not to drive. Accounting for population size, the places in the United States that are the most dangerous for pedestrians are in this order, New Mexico, Washington, D.C., Florida, Arizona, South Carolina, Louisiana, and Nevada. And the infrastructure law does fund some projects that would reduce these atrocious statistics. So first of all, it adds protected bike lanes and bike share projects to the list of projects allowed to be funded by the Highway Safety Improvement Project. So kind of does what I've been asking for, saying get people off the roads, and provide safer alternatives. So I'm happy to see that. It also adds non-motorists to the list of people who must be protected by highway safety improvement projects, not just the drivers. And unlike so many provisions we've seen, there is an actual requirement in here that says that if 15% or more of a state's annual crash fatalities are made up of non-motorists, that state will be required to spend at least 15% of its highway safety improvement project money on projects designed to improve the safety for walkers and bikers. And this is by far my favorite provision in the driver safety portion of the infrastructure law, even though it isn't all that ambitious. But I am happy to see that walkers and bikers will have to be factored into vehicle infrastructure decisions going forward. And it's crazy to me that they weren't required factors before. But it certainly does explain a lot about how our infrastructure got to be the way it is. The law also makes a legal standard for when you're on these bike lines for what can be considered an electric bicycle. And this one I took note of because you might remember that at the end of 2021, I spent some time living on the beach in Playa del Rey, California. Great little town. It's in Southern California. We have amazing bike lanes. And it was right outside of where we stayed. And so I went for runs on the, the path every day. And I went to colleges in this neighborhood. I know these paths very well. And I've never felt so threatened on these paths before because people are now riding these electric bikes on there and going so fast that I was afraid a few times that I would get hit. And I eventually just stopped walking my dog on the path because, you know, she's a little crazy. She's not very good at walking on one side of me. And I just felt like it, they, they go so fast now that she could just too easily get hit. And so she ended up just like not going on the paths. And that, that just kind of sucked. And so I just, I see a danger with how fast these electric bikes can go. And so what this new law is going to do is it's going to say that it's something can't be considered an electric bike unless it stops assisting the rider at a maximum of 28 miles per hour, which still seems a little high, but at least there is a limit. Anything above 28 miles per hour will no longer be considered a bicycle, but instead it will be considered a moped or motorcycle, which limits the places that it can go. This was already understood by the industry to be the limit by regulation, but now it's a part of the federal law. The new law also, by the end of this year, 2022, requires the Secretary of Transportation to create a pilot program. So those are experimental programs that can become permanent if successful. It's going to create a pilot program to fund bollard installation projects, which are projects that raise concrete or metal posts on a sidewalk next to a road, and they're designed to slow or stop a motor vehicle. You most likely have seen these in front of like federal buildings and stuff to stop basically like the Oklahoma City bombing from happening again. But when I was in Portugal, I saw these things all over the place, separating the roads from the bike lanes and the pedestrian paths so that if a car does veer off the road, it would bounce back into the road and not hit the people that were using the, the bike and pedestrian lanes. And so I really loved them. They really do help you feel like you are separate from the cars, even though you're physically close to them. And I felt so much safer because of that separation. 
And so what the new law is going to do is that the pilot program grants are going to pay for 100% of the project costs. And that's significant and good because many of these programs, they only pay 80%, which requires the states to pay the remaining 20% which if their budgets are tight, this is often cost prohibitive. And that means that the states just don't participate in these programs. And so essentially a 100% federal grant, these are like free money. So the likelihood of state participation is much higher. The only thing that makes me sad though, is that the law provides only 5 million per year through 2026 for these bollard installation projects. And I found an estimate from a company from the St. Paul Design and Bollard Company from 2020 that each bollard, each metal pole costs between $700 and $1,200 to install, which means that $5 million for the whole country will only install at most about 7,000 poles per year. That's about 142 poles per year per state. And that's just not a lot. And so unfortunately, while it's a good idea, this isn't going to be a transformative investment. But there is a separate provision authorized to spend a billion dollars total to fund walking and biking infrastructure projects that cost 15 million or more and connect communities to each other, including communities in different states and connect to public transportation. Now, one billion dollars doesn't go too far with vehicle infrastructure, but it can go far when creating infrastructure as simple as walking paths and bike lanes. The only catch, though, is the federal split. Unlike the provision before that funds the projects 100% with federal money, the walking paths and bike lanes, and remember, these are big projects, each cost $15 million or more. Well, these will be funded with only 80% federal funds. This means that if states are not prioritizing these projects already and don't want to find at least $3 million per project in their own budgets, which is 20% of a $15 million project, then the states likely won't participate in this grant program. Now, there is an exception that will help this, which is that in communities with a poverty rate over 40 percent, in those communities, the federal government will pay 100 percent of the project costs. And so that does greatly increase the likelihood of walking and biking projects going into communities that probably need them the most. And so I think that's great. But I do think that the 80-20 split will mean that places like San Francisco and Austin and New York City, Los Angeles, Denver, cities that are already integrating walking and biking into their transportation mixes, they will get money to continue to do so and do so quickly, which is great. Seriously great. But places that need basics like sidewalks and bike lanes, looking at you, Toledo, they probably won't. Those are the places that need the free money to make it a political no-brainer in those places to go forward with these projects. And so in the places where walking and biking is currently super dangerous and the local politicians are vehicle infrastructure devoted, I don't see this lowering their pedestrian death rates that much. And that's a real shame. And so unacceptably high rates of car crashes in the United States is something that I think we just have to continue to accept for a while because this law sure as shit didn't fix it. And so when those crashes happen, we need a 911 system that is the best it can be to help us survive. In these times, over 80% of 911 calls are being made from mobile devices. However, our nation's old ass 911 systems are relying on old ass infrastructure that isn't designed to work with our new communications technologies. Now to deal with this in 2012, a decade ago, Congress passed and President Obama signed the Next Generation 911 Advancement Act of 2012, which launched a project aimed at getting states and local governments to upgrade their 911 systems to be compatible with the technology that you have in your pocket. The goal is to create a national 911 system that connects all 6,000 or so 911 call centers in the United States. Now, when, I should say if, this project is completed, All 911 call centers should be able to not only receive voice calls as they do now, but also text messages, images, video, and vehicle crash data. The call centers would also get the ability to transfer calls and data in order to increase information sharing with first responders. And so instead of like relaying information to a 911 operator when you're, you know, in an emergency who then tells the cops what you told them, your call could be transferred to the cops standing outside your door. And I definitely want that capability to exist. But there was a big problem with the 2012 law. The 2012 law didn't require the states to transition their 911 services. 
It was optional. Also, for the states that do choose to upgrade, there were no federally mandated deadlines for implementation. They could just kind of get it done whenever. As for the federal government's role, outside of its role as piggy bank, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's National 911 program was tasked with coordinating the optional upgrades and connection of 911 systems between federal, state, and local agencies. And a recent Government Accountability Office report made it crystal clear that they are just not doing that. The report said that between 2012 and 2018, so let's name them, the Obama and Trump administrations had not written out a plan for how the national integration would happen. They had published no goals or performance measures. They had not made it clear who would be in charge of what tasks, not that a to-do list was ever created either. And so how is this project going 10 years later? Well, the 2018 Government Accountability Office study found that not one single state had completely completed the implementation. And the main reasons provided by the states were that they were concerned about privacy, liability, and the ability to store and manage all the new kinds of data that they would be collecting, which we have to blame on Congress because these are the types of issues that Congress is supposed to consider when crafting a law. Time after time, we see Congress create laws that authorize big projects with very few details for how it must be done within the law itself. Instead, Congress has consistently ceded their power to other agencies to make policy decisions. But it's Congress that's supposed to determine privacy laws and what data can be stored and by whom and for how long. But they didn't do that. And so this whole project is in limbo because of those basic questions that were left unanswered in 2012. And so not a single state is actually able to use text messages or images or videos that we could send to 911 to help us in emergencies. That said, 10 states could do that right now if the policy issues were worked out by Congress, because 10 states already have the basic functioning next generation 911 infrastructure installed, and they're already using it to process the voice calls, but the voice calls alone. But those 10 states, which I'm sorry I can't name, but they weren't listed, but those 10 states, they have the infrastructure. They could handle our texts and our pictures and our videos, and they, they could do it right now, but they have this amazing capability on standby. And that's the best we've got so far, 10 states with the capability on standby. And then on the other end of the spectrum, more states, 18 states, reported that they not only have no next generation 911 equipment installed, but they also don't have any plans to install it either. And so that's 18 opt outs out of 50 states. And so if the goal is a national 911 system, this isn't going to do it. Those 18 states did provide reasons, though, for their lack of plans for the upgrades, aside from the obvious, like, we weren't required to do the upgrades. And the main reason given was money. The states fund the project using 911 fees, which are collected from phone users. And those are collected by each state in each state's own way. And many of the states are not collecting enough money to cover the actual upgrade costs. On top of that, some states allow their 911 fees to be diverted to other things. States also talked about the difficulty coordinating among the different public and private networks in their states. Because we don't treat communications as a basic-ass utility in the United States. Hell, we don't treat basic-ass utilities like electricity, like basic-ass utilities in the United States. Instead, we allow our systems to be chaotic, piecemeal systems with, I don't even know how many companies and governments governing little sections of it. And so creating a system, nationwide system... That involves a lot of coordination. And the more pieces in the system that need to be coordinated, the more complicated that is. Specifically, the state said that rather having to implement tasks in a single nationwide approach to routing our cell phone calls to 911, state and local 911 authorities have to work individually with each of the telecom companies to determine how to best implement location-based call routing. Now, the Government Accountability Office was looking into what the federal government can do with the laws already on the books to move this project forward. And it concluded that the feds can do three things. One, they can enact goals and performance measures. They can, two, clarify roles and responsibilities with the people in charge. And three, they can write out a plan for how national integration will be done, which seems to me like three things that should have been done 10 years ago. And in fact, some of them really should have been done. 
at least the performance requirements and not theoretically, but like by law, because there was a part of the 2012 law that required the transportation department, the Obama one specifically, to have timelines and performance requirements for anyone who got a grant for this project. Those timelines and performance requirements were supposed to be written by the end of 2012, but obviously that law was broken. And so instead of accountability for anyone for this decade long failure, this Congress just deleted that requirement from the law, repealed it, poof, like the law breaking never happened. And so the new infrastructure law lets them get a legal redo on enacting goals and performance measures and then expands the new requirements to include the GAO's other two recommendations. So roles and responsibilities for the people in charge and an overall written plan. But there still are no timelines for completion required anymore. That part was truly repealed. And after a decade, that just sounds unacceptably close to the beginning of a process for a project that affects all of our safety and should have been much further along after being authorized and funded for a decade. We can do better than this. And I wish we had more people in government who had faith in that, too. But for the next gen 911 project, the biggest obstacle towards real progress on it is that the big problem remained unsolved by the infrastructure law, mainly that this effort is still optional for the states. Congress also did nothing to address the policy issues of those 10 states that have done their part. They've installed the infrastructure. They're waiting to use it. But the policy issues related to privacy and liability and data storage, those were left unresolved, too. And so the states that have the infrastructure just sitting there idling, they're going to leave it still idling, you know? So we have this equipment that could be used to like, you know, text 911 from the back of an unexpectedly locked Uber or text 911 a screenshot of Google to show them silently where you are. You know, this is life-saving equipment and it's going to continue to collect dust. And we're all less safe than we could be because of it. And it's just such a wasted opportunity. And so overall, in my opinion, the infrastructure law made some minor improvements, sure, but I see this law itself as a major wasted opportunity. They could have funded safer transportation alternatives at a significant level, but they chose an 80-20 split in favor of expanding vehicle infrastructure, keeping us dependent on the most dangerous mode of transportation. And the safety improvements They're just too minor, or in the case of robot cars, non-existent, or in the case with motorcyclists going backwards, for me to be in any way satisfied with the changes coming because of this law. And so that's why I make the face (laughs) when someone says like, oh, well, the Democrats did get that infrastructure law passed. The devil's in the details. And the details, I don't like the details. Okay, so I am in Austin, Texas right now, and I want to meet you. If you're in Austin, Texas, and you're hearing this in time, I am going to be at Cosmic Coffee on South Congress on Wednesday, May 11th, with Justin Robert Young, the host of Politics, 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 and Andrew Heaton, the host of Political Orphanage. And we actually didn't set a time. So let's say 6 (laughs) p.m. I will be there at 6 and the boys will be there whenever they can. But yeah, Cosmic Coffee on South Congress. Let's have a meetup because I would love to meet you in person. Let's see what else is going on here. I said in the beginning, but I'll give you some more specific numbers that we got financially rocked in April. I have not gotten any of the usual accompanying emails that come when someone's super mad at me because of something I said. In fact, for the Ukraine episodes, I got a lot of support. So I don't think it's that. I think that a lot of people are financially hurting. But the details are in April, we are down $104 per episode. We lost 10 people in April. And then now for May, I'm recording this on May 6th, we're down five more people We're down 25 additional dollars per episode. And then also something that happens every single month is that if Patreon can't process a credit card pledge, then we lose those people too. So we actually had some of those. So if you are a patron, like please check and make sure that your account is actually still valid because some of them aren't. 
But yeah, we got rocked. So we're looking at about $130 less per episode. And that is not insignificant. So if you are in the position to help the podcast out, this would be a really good time to step in and fill in for some of our are, uh, you know, members of the community who are struggling right now. And you can do that on Patreon, Venmo, Zelle, Paper Checks. You can buy merchandise in the Congressional Dish store. Oh, and also one of the reasons why money is a concern right now is because we're building a YouTube page. So we're putting all of these full episodes up on YouTube now because I keep meeting people who say they only listen to podcasts on YouTube. And I don't get it, but I will put the podcast there for you. So we're doing that. And then also we're creating these preview videos that you can share. They're usually under five minutes long, but they're highlights of these episodes because we know that it's it's tough to share a full episode that's over an hour long, but it's easy to share you know, a little snippet of something interesting. And hopefully you can help people discover the podcast that way. So please go to our YouTube page. I made a very easy address for you. It's congressionaldish.tv. That'll take you to our YouTube page and please subscribe and check that out and share the videos. If you want to spread the word about the podcast, it would be so helpful. And also I want to say happy birthday to Ben Barnett. A donation came in from Lena who donated on behalf for your birthday. And so from both Lena and I, I would like to say happy birthday to you, Ben. And I'm so happy you're a fan of the show. I'm also very happy to announce that we have two new executive producers. Executive producers are people that either over the course of many years or all at once have contributed $535. Every time you do that, you get to put your name on an episode of your choice as basically your public vouch for that episode. And so I would like to welcome Kevin to the ranks of executive producers and the episode he picked. This is a cool one. So here's Kevin's message. He said, Jen... You're welcome for the donation. I started listening to your podcast at episode one. I made it up to episode 70 so far, and I'm enjoying most of them. He says, fired in Boston Marathon were a bummer. Yes. And for those of you who haven't started from the beginning, first of all, I don't recommend you do that. <laughs> I'm like kind of mortified that they're still out there because I didn't know what I was doing. Although there is really inf- interesting information in there. But fired was at the end of 2013 when Joe was fired from his job when we were living in Boston and we had to decide, am I going to quit the show and go back to, you know, pay checky jobs or are we going to double down on this and find a way? And we decided to double down and find a way, but fired was the conversation between Joe and I that we had about that. And I decided to make it public. And then Boston marathon kind of speaks for itself, but that was the day of the bombing. So the show was very different back then, but Kevin is listening to it from the beginning. But back to Kevin's note, he said, your research and podcast content are truly amazing. And together, it helps me fill in the gaps between the insufficient facts that I remember from the 2010s. I would like to sponsor an episode. It is episode 21, Trailblazer versus Thin Thread. I knew about NSA activities from news stories about Snowden, but this episode really affected me. I'm not so naive to think that this couldn't happen in the U.S. It was how it was done that made me question my beliefs. Wow. I'd like to thank Joe and your family for supporting you and the podcast through the uncertain times in 2013 and 2014. I'm glad the podcast is still active and I'll catch up eventually. Well, thank you, Kevin. And I love that you picked that episode until you brought it up. I haven't thought about that in years. But yeah, Trailblazer versus Thin Thread. You know, just to give you a summary of it, during the W. Bush years, the beginning of them, the NSA had developed an in-house program called Thin Thread, which was a system for intelligence gathering that was apparently working just fine without having to collect and keep all of the data in the world. But the George W. Bush administration, which stood for privatizing as much of our government as they possibly could, they chose to replace Thin Thread with an expensive, like, billions of dollars kind of expensive private system called Trailblazer. And there's all kinds of details about how the contracting was shady and the whole thing is shady. And actually, I put an article for you in this episode show notes if you want to go down that rabbit hole. There was an article in The Nation that really explained the whole thing really well. But essentially, this new private system, Trailblazer, did a terrible job with intelligence analyzation. It was designed in a way that made it more suitable for data mining, and it failed to catch the emails and other signals that could have prevented 9-11, signals that whistleblowers from the NSA in 2002 believed that the in-house NSA system that was scrapped, they think their system would have caught the 9-11 signals and could have prevented that horrible day. 
And one of the things I just find fascinating about that whole ordeal, looking back on it 20 years later, is that the man responsible for those decisions at the NSA was General Michael Hayden, who is now a principal at the Chertoff Group. He's been there for well over a decade. But that's a company that makes money selling intelligence services. And he's also now on the board of directors at the Atlantic Council, whose zealots for global privatization we see testify to Congress all the time. And actually, I saw Michael Hayden himself on MSNBC recently. And so Michael Hayden, a human whose failures included 9-11, is still extremely powerful and respected in Washington, D.C., the private sector and the media. And so it just seems to me like there's a certain class of white dudes in America that the only way for them to fail is up. And General Michael Hayden is one of like the prime examples of that for me. So yeah, the full story was told in episode 21. I'm very happy to have your name on that episode, Kevin. And um, thanks for reminding me that that even happened. It's cool that that episode has an EP now. We also now have Alex Bolata, who is going to be one of our executive producers for Congressionalist 248, Understanding the Enemy. And here's his message. She said, hi, Jen. I know I don't reach out all too often, but your last episode on Ukraine encapsulated everything I admire about this podcast. You successfully portrayed the reality as convoluted as it may be. I've been trying to make sense of Putin's actions over the last few weeks myself and knew that by listening to your podcast, I would be informed of the nuances that most media outlets willingly or naively chose not to cover. Thank you for providing the sometimes uncomfortable reality in which we live in. I started listening in 2015 when I was an international graduate student in Detroit and wanted to keep to up to date with politics. As I'm neither a Republican nor Democrat, being a foreigner, I struggled to find a news outlet that presented multiple sides of a story until I landed on Congressional Dish. Over the years, even when I moved back to Canada, I continued to support the podcast, even though the impact of U.S. politics had become less relevant to my life because sources for reliable news are hard to come by. When I listened to Congressional Dish 248, Understanding the Enemy, it reminded me of how valuable your podcast is and how much I am grateful for the work you do. Thank you for keeping me, and by proxy, as the political junkie of my group, my network informed. On that note, I will be providing a $100 bonus for the last episode and hopefully qualify to be the executive producer of Congressional's 248. Enjoy your time in Portugal. All the best from La Belle Province, your friendly neighbor from the North, Alex. Well, thank you, Alex. And I love that you are supporting the show, even though you're not here, you're not an American, but I do think that what the United States does affects the world. And I think Ukraine is a prime example of that dynamic. So yeah, thanks for supporting the podcast. I know that I've seen your name many times over the years, and I'm happy that you're still around and that I'm still creating something that you find value in. So thank you so much. And thank you to everyone again who's supporting the show. I absolutely adore you guys. No green room preview this time, although I do want to tell you that there is an interview that I put up there. I had Justin Robert Young over to my hotel room here in Austin. We drank some White Claws. And after bullshitting for a while, we talked about this super interesting story about Disney World. Apparently, Disney World is its own private government. And Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is trying to take away their government status. And Justin is from Florida. And so he knew the history of it. So super interesting conversation. And that is in the green room for you. And the green room is my nickname for the Patreon feed. And then if you want to donate in a way that's not Patreon, just go ahead and do that. You email Lauren at congressionaldish.com and we will get you set up with the feed. So it doesn't have to be Patreon, but the two feeds are exactly the same. But some people hate Patreon. I don't get it. I think they've been really great to us. But yeah, however you want to donate, we can get you access to that feed. And so that's what's up there for you now. The next episode I haven't quite decided on, but there is also a poll up on Patreon right now. And I'll be making that decision in the next couple of days. So if you want to weigh in on whether or not I do this topic I'm thinking about, please log on to Patreon and make your opinion heard because I, I'm either going to dive back into the infrastructure law or do this other episode. So yeah, producers, I want your opinion. Okay, so that's it for today. I will talk to you soon. Take care of yourselves and bye-bye. We don't have a domestic spying program. They're content to fight in black and white despite the many in between. We got a president who plays with the facts. With the facts. And then he waves a flag to cover his tracks. As if a lie is alright, if the end will justify the means. Now we are so damn tired of being. 
the polar ice caps aren't going away. We don't think we can deny it. Government jobs consume the profits of the private sector. We don't think we can deny it anymore. You can stick to your story if you think it flies. But we're not keeping quiet anymore. These bills represent common sense, bipartisan solutions that actually solve problems. 